Welcome to George McDonald and Us. This is Catherine. And this is Sean. And today on the George McDonald and Us podcast, we are going to be reading and discussing George McDonald's poem, Willie's Question. And the poem is a dialogue between a father and his son, Willie. And just to keep it simple and clear for our listeners, I will be playing Willie. So whenever I speak, it is Willie speaking. And whenever Sean speaks, it's the father. So Sean will be playing the father. I will be playing Willie. And here is the poem, Willie's Question, by George MacDonald. Is it wrong the wish to be great? For I do wish it so. I have asked already my sister Kate. She says she does not know. Yester eve at the gate I stood, watching the sun in the west. When I saw him look so grand and good, it swelled up in my breast. Next from the rising moon, it stole like a silver dart. In the night, when the wind began his tune, it woke with a sudden start. This morning, a trumpet blast made all the cottage quake. It came so sudden and shook so fast, it blew me wide awake. It told me I must make haste and some great glory win. For every day was running to waste, and at once I must begin. I want to be great and strong. I want to begin today. But if you think it very wrong, I will send the wish away. Wrong to wish to be great? No, Willie, it is not wrong. The child who stands at the high closed gate must wish to be tall and strong. If you did not wish to grow, I should be a sorry man. I should think my boy was dull and slow, not worthy of his clan. You are bound to be great, my boy. Wish and get up and do. Were you content to be little, my joy would be little enough in you. Papa, Papa, I'm so glad that what I wish is right. I will not lose a chance to be had. I'll begin this very night. I will work so hard at school. I will waste no time in play. At my fingers' ends I'll have every rule, for knowledge is power, they say. I would be a king and reign, but I can't be that, and so a field marshal I'll be, I think, and gain sharp battles and sieges slow. I shall gallop and shout and call, waving my shining sword. Artillery, cavalry, infantry all, hear and obey my word. Or admiral I will be wherever the salt wave runs, sailing, fighting over the sea with flashing and roaring guns. I will make myself hardy and strong. I will never, never give in. I am so glad it is not wrong. At once I will begin. Fighting and shining along, all for the show of the thing. Any puppet will mimic in the grand and strong if you pull the proper string. But indeed, I want to be great. I should despise mere show. The thing I want is the glorious state above the rest, you know. The harder you run that race, the farther you tread that track. The greatness you fancy before your face is the farther behind your back. To be up in the heavens afar, miles above all the rest, would make a star not the greatest star, only the dreariest. That book on the highest shelf is not the greatest book. If you would be great, it must be in yourself, neither by place nor look. The highest is not high by being higher than others. To greatness you come not a step more nigh by getting above your brothers. I meant the boys at school. I did not mean my brother. Somebody first is there the rule. It must be me or another. Oh, Willie, it's all the same. They are your brothers all. For when you say, hallowed be thy name, whose father is it you call? 
Could you pray for such rule to him? Do you think that he would hear? Must he favor one in a greedy whim, where all are his children dear? It is right to get up and do, but why outstrip the rest? Why should one of the many be one of the few? Why should you think to be best? Then how am I to be great? I know no other way. It would be folly to sit and wait. I must up and do, you say. I do not want you to wait, for few before they die have gone so far as begin to be great. The lesson is so high. I will tell you the only plan to climb and not to fall. He who would rise and be greater than he is must be servant of all. Turn it each way in your mind, try every other plan. You may think yourself great, but at length you'll find you are not even a man. Climb to the top of the trees, climb to the top of the hill. Get up on the crown of the sky if you please, you'll be a small creature still. Be admiral, poet, or king, let praises fill both your ears. Your soul will be but a windmill thing, blown round by its hopes and fears. Then put me in the way, for you, papa, are a man. What thing shall I do this very day? Only be sure I can. I want to know. I am willing. Let me at least have a chance. Shall I give the monkey boy my shilling? I want to serve at once. Give all your shillings you might and hurt your brothers the more. He only can serve as fellows are right when goes in at the little door. We must do the thing we must before the thing we may. We are unfit for any trust till we can and do obey. I will try more and more. I have nothing now to ask. Obedience, I know, is the little door. Now set me some hard task. No, Willie, the father of all, teacher and master high, has set your task beyond recall. Nothing can set it by. What is it, father dear, that he would have me do? I'd ask himself, but he's not near, and so I must ask you. Me, tis no use to ask. I, too, am one of his boys, but he tells each boy his own plan to plain task. Listen and hear his voice. Father, I'm listening so to hear him if I may. His voice must either be very low or very far away. It is neither hard to hear nor hard to understand. It is very low but very near, a still, small, strong command. I do not hear it at all. I am only hearing you. Think, is there nothing great or small you ought to go and do? Let me think. I ought to feed my rabbits. I went away in such a hurry this morning. Indeed, they've not had enough today. That is his whisper, low. That is his very word. You have only to stop and listen, and so very plainly you heard. That duty's the little door. You must open it and go in. There is nothing else to do before. There is nowhere else to begin. But that's so easily done. It's such a trifling affair. So nearly over as soon begun. For that he can hardly care. You are turning from his call if you let that duty wait. You would not think any duty small if you yourself were great. The nearest is at life's core. With the first, you all begin. What matter how little the little door, if it only let you in. Papa, I am come again. It is now three months and more that I've tried to do the thing that was plain, and I feel as small as before. Your honor comes too slow? How much then have you done? One foot on a mole heap, would you crow as if you had reached the sun? But I cannot help a doubt whether this way be the true. The more I do to work it out, the more there comes to do. And yet, were all done and past, I should feel just as small. For when I tried to do the very last, t'was my duty after all. It is only much the same as not being liar or thief. 
One who tried it found even with shame that of sinners he was the chief. My boy, I am glad indeed you have been finding the truth. But where's the good? I shall never speed. Be one whit greater in sooth. If duty itself must fail, and that be the only plan, how shall my scarce begun duty prevail to make me a mighty man? Ah, Willie, what if it were quite another way to fall? What if the greatness itself lie there in knowing that you are small? In seeing the good so good that you feel poor, weak, and low, and hungrily long for it as for food, with an endless need to grow. The man who was lord of fate, born in an ox's stall, was great because he was much too great to care about greatness at all. Ever and only he sought the will of his father good, never of what, what was high he thought, but of what his father would. You long to be great, you try, you feel yourself smaller still. In the name of God, let ambition die, let him make you what he will. Who does the truth is one with the living truth above. Be God's obedient little son, let ambition die in love. I'll let you kick it off. <laughs> well, oh man, I just feel like there's a lot to unpack here. Sean, um, so you chose this poem. Um, what, what about this poem struck you or made you want to choose it for our show tonight? Well, I read this poem a while back and I just I thought it was really good. I think it's, it speaks to a question that I think a lot of people have and ambitions and doing, you know, being the best that you can be and how do you do that? And how do you make sure that you're not, you know, going after something that isn't really the truth or isn't right? And I think there's just a, yeah, I just think it speaks to the heart of a lot of people in general, you know, in a way that I really, I really like, you know, the answer at the end. And I think maybe you don't always hear that answer at the end. Right. No, I know. It is like a very loving response. I mean, I feel like it's a very loving dialogue between a father and his son. I mean, Willie starts out, he's feeling very inspired, obviously, by the sun, the moon, the trumpet, and he wants to be great. And he's asking his father if that wish is wrong. And his dad is like, no, it's not wrong at all. And like, I would be sad if you didn't have this desire to be great. And I just love that response on behalf of the father. Yeah, and I do like that the nature is kind of what kicks off his uh, Willie's thoughts, that the watching the sun in the west looks so grand and good. And the rising moon, it stole like a silver dart. I, I thought that was really cool that George MacDonald is kind of hinting at nature being a good way of stirring this up in one's soul, you know. And, uh, yeah, I think maybe that's just in general, general beauty is meant. It can do that as well. Mm. But I, I like that start. That That's what kind of starts it off for Willie, I think is kind of cool. Yeah, now that you mention it, I feel like a theme in a lot of George MacDonald's works is the personification of of nature. Like, his, the sun is a he. I saw him look so grand and good. And then the moon. And then, um, well, I guess the moon is an it. But then the night wind began his tune. And, yeah, like, things are, like, alive. Like, wind is alive. Yeah, wind is alive a lot in George MacDonald's work. Yeah. At the back of the North Wind is a good example of that. Yeah. And I just think... I think that kind of speaks to, like, a cosmological theology. 
that is kind of unique to the East, I think, where St. Maximus the Confessor um, just speaks to like a a cosmic understanding of, of theology in the world. And it's different from pantheism. I think it's like, it's different from pantheism, which is, I think, you know, and listeners correct me if I'm wrong, but pantheism is like, things are gods. Whereas I think in George MacDonald's and um, uh, St. Maximus the Confessors, like everything participates with God. Yeah, it comes from God. Yeah. I think he's pretty clear in his works on that. And that's what, there's like a living element to them. I mean, they don't, they're not alive like we are. I think of like, we just had this discussion, Sean and I did, about what constitutes a living thing. And I mean, I like Aquinas, how he says, you know, an an animated thing, like an angel, a human, an animal, and a plant, those all have an anima or an animus, like they all are, they all have a soul because they, they are alive. Um, and that's different than like the wind, like the wind doesn't have a soul as an angel, a human, an animal, or a plant does. And yet, because it participates in God, like it has a livingness to it. And I just, I like that George MacDonald subtly puts that into his art. I okay, so something that struck me from the very beginning is that he he asks his sister Kate and she says she does not know. And it's just interesting that that's how the poem starts out. He goes to his sister, the feminine first, and asks her if it's wrong to wish to be great and she says she doesn't know. And so I kind of like how the the focus of this poem is on this special gift of the masculine to like clarify and order things in a way that's unique to masculinity. I was listening to Robert Johnson, who is a Jungian um, thinker, before as I was preparing for this podcast, because a lot of it reminded me of the tale of Psyche and Cupid and what it means to do work. And that's different for men and women. And I think Johnson and Jung talks a lot about how each person has a feminine and a masculine part inside. And so we don't want to just say this only applies to women or this only applies to men. But there is, like, we don't also want to totally eliminate the special relationship that women have with something versus men like it's kind of like blurred or it's like there's two circles converging a man's response to what it means to be great is a little different from a woman's and i just have this quote that i think sums it up what i mean here so robert johnson says when a woman is touched by an archetypal experience she often collapses before it it is in this collapse that she quickly recovers her archetypal connection, and reaches her inner being. This constellates the helpful elements in her deeper self. A woman does this in a different way from a man. While he has to go out seeking a heroic task, slaying many dragons, and rescue fair maidens, she generally has to withdraw to a very quiet place and remain still. So I think, like, the fact that Kate doesn't know if it's wrong to wish to be great speaks to this difference already because immediately Willie and the father talk about what it means to be a hero. Um, Whereas Kate, (laughs) it's going to be a different experience, you know? But it's not in the typical way that you would think of a hero. That's true. Like, it's not going out and doing the grand things that Willie wants to do in war or which yeah is 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 interesting I guess with that quote that you read that's it's almost like a 
would you say that the message of the poem is a more feminine archetype? Well, it is. Then? Well, see, I don't, that's a good question. I think that, I think that the feminine informs the masculine a lot in this poem when it comes to what it actually means to be great and what it actually means to do tasks. Um, but I don't know, maybe like in some ways, I, I disagree with George MacDonald's downplaying of Willie's desire to be a king and gallop and shout and wave his shining sword. I do think that that childlike desire for those things is part of masculinity that is very symbolic you know should be an, understood in a symbolic level because okay as I was reading this poem I was thinking I think it's a poem about inflation and deflation and the father is trying to protect Willie from being too inflated but he's also trying to protect him from being too deflated. So he's saying it's not wrong to wish to be great. It's good to wish to be great. But if you wish to be great in this way, that's, that's a problem or that's not good. Well, yeah, I, I, I can see that. But I think George MacDonald is saying more that you have to rely on God to tell you which way. Like, being a field marshal might be the right way. That might be what God is calling you to to do. But I feel like the Father is kind of saying, hey, wait, you have to do your duty first and focus on his will for you, and he will show you where, where you, what you're going to do. So to me, it's I see the father more as like preaching patience and almost like you have to order your life this way. You have to focus on duty so that you can build up to the point where you actually can fulfill God's purpose for you and focus on his will, which is a very Catholic thing. I think. Say more about that. I, I think what, when you think about the virtues, mm -hmm. I mean, the whole virtues are set up. The, I, I don't think this could be more perfect to spell out the virtues, really, when you think about it, because charity is the ultimate virtue, theological virtue. And basically the meaning of charity is to do God's will for his sake and for the sake of of God's people. So that's the father here is saying, I mean, ultimately you're striving for charity, which is what every Catholic should be doing according to the virtues. But there's other virtues that get you there along the way. Like everything does, I don't know if everything comes from charity, um, I mean, I'm still learning about this. It's kind of, it is pretty pretty deep, um, but the th the difference between the moral virtues and the theological virtues, where the moral virtues are um, focusing on not God but like others around you and then the theological virtues are focusing on God so they complement each other but I think the the father is kind of saying you have to get the moral virtues kind of down so that you can have the theological virtues kind of come from that it's kind of what I'm thinking when I, when I say that um, yeah well, yeah, I mean, he definitely wants Willie to turn inward. Yeah. To hear God's word. I mean, I like how he doesn't just spoon feed it to Willie. 
Mm-hmm. He's not. He's. It's not what I want you to do. Like, turn inward. He. Oh man, I love it how the father says, "Me, tis no use to ask. I too am one of his boys." Yeah, I like that line a lot. But he tells each boy his own plain task. Listen and hear his voice. The father is really, oh man, I really love that. Because I think sometimes it's too, when we hear the word, at least, okay, when I hear the word obedience nowadays, within a Christian context, I think of the Duggar family. Or like, all the ways that obedience has been abused in Christianity lately. Where it's like this very dehumanizing, false authoritarian thing that is divorced from Christianity, really. And I love that the father clarifies in this poem that that's not what this is about, that he himself is a boy. And to listen, to like really turn inward. And I love Willie's frustration, though, because he's like, I don't hear his voice. You know, I don't, he, he repeats it. I don't hear anything at all. And the father's like, think, is there nothing great or small you ought to go and do? And then it dawns on him that he forgot to feed his rats. Yeah. I think the father does a really good job, I think, of like, it's not being obedient to him as the father. It's keep, he keeps pointing him to God. And so that's kind of the whole point of the virtues is to point you towards god but it's interesting that at least in this poem god is inside of willie yeah well uh, let's explain that a little bit more well he's he's the father keeps saying like um he tells each boy his own plain task listen and hear his voice And Willie keeps trying to hear something that's outside of him. He's trying to hear something, a voice that's out there. I mean, like, again, I I just think he's like, he he keeps trying to return Willie into himself. And then it finally clicks. I ought to feed my rabbits. They went away in such a hurry this morning. Indeed, they've not had enough today. And the father says, that is his whisper low. That is his very word. You only had to stop and listen, and so very plainly you heard that duty's the little door. You must open it and go in. There is nothing else to do before. There is nowhere else to begin. And so I think it is a very, like, interior door. And Willie's like, it's too easy. You know, <laughs> yeah, I love that too. I, uh, it's such a trifling affair, and I think this is like where I do find a lot of inflation and deflation in this poem. The tension of the two it sparks this inner energy for Willie to go and feed his rabbits, and what's interesting is like. He comes back in three months, and he still feels small. Mm-hmm. He doesn't, like, yeah, I like feel that part grand. Of the poem. Yeah. I like that in the poem, it does say that, you know, that he does go out and do it for a while, which is cool. And I, th- I think George MacDonald, he is always kind of like a con- contrarian, you know, yeah. and that is... Kind of, it's it is very to truth, you know, as far as your duties are not always going to be feeling like the high ideals that you want to go after, even things that you really want to do, but like you can't skip over them. There's the the one line I can't remember. I I gotta find it. Yeah, yeah, the the. Kind of halfway through the poem here, we must do the thing we must before the thing we may. I really like that line a lot. Mm. Because, I mean, that's 
something that you have to think about basically every day. And he was talking about that in, in terms of what he was saying, should I give the monkey boy my shilling? You, you shouldn't give him your shilling unless you've already fulfilled your other duties first, mm-hmm. which is kind of a contrarian way of thinking that. I mean, that's not something that I really think, you know. Why does that strike you, or what, what's coming to your mind? Or... Well, it's very true, I guess, I, now that I think about it, but he'd probably be, I think he's maybe speaking, like, people that do give a lot, away a lot of money, but, you know, there might be other duties that they're totally neglecting. Like, maybe it's their kids, or, you know, if they've made a lot of money and they aren't around for their kids, or they give away all this money, you know, he would probably say that this would be the example. Why not to do that? It'd be better to just make sure you're there for your kids than give away all this money. But but you don't hear anybody really saying that. That's Everybody's true. just glorifying, well, they're a big donor, or, you know... That's the one example I guess I can think of that people are glorified in our culture, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's like we want, we all want to become the archetype, I guess, or we all want to become the great thing. And in doing that, I think we we lose sight of ourselves and we, yeah, Mm -hmm. like we lose sight of of the work and I I see this struggle in myself all the time I picture the end goal I picture what it could be in this like perfect state or I I do picture the good um but I don't I struggle with bringing that good about through the menial tasks you know like I (laughs) And I can become quite inflated, quite ungrounded. And for me, it's been really important to start out my day doing the grounding work. So, you know, I start the day and I I think about all these grand ways it could go, all the fun we could have. And I have to pay attention to this desire within me also in the start of the day to do something really grounding and menial, like whether it's putting the dishes away or doing laundry and just to make sure that I'm doing that day-to-day drudge work. Now, I do want to clarify something about that day-to-day drudge work, though. In the same Robert Johnson book, he was talking about psyche and one of her tasks is to sort seeds so if you're not familiar with the story of psyche and cupid basically psyche and cupid when they get married but psyche never sees cupid she only knows he's like this i don't know shadowy monster that she sleeps with that night she loves him And her jealous sisters end up convincing her to sneak a lamp in one night while they're sleeping. And instead of a monster, she sees the most beautiful god. You know, Cupid is Aphrodite's son. And, but because of, she like disobeyed the rule, she is punished. And she's punished by Aphrodite, her mother-in-law. And... Aphrodite gives her all these impossible tasks in hope of killing Psyche. Um, And one of them is to sort seeds, which is an impossible task for Psyche. And so she tries to commit suicide. But before she can do that, these ants come and sort them out for her by nightfall. And Robert Johnson talks about this. Practical matters, form and order, like this is something unique to the feminine. You know, we have our shopping lists. We're just always striving for order and form. We sort 
and order the seeds um, in our lives and we bring them into fruition. And if we over schedule this element of our lives, so if we say Tuesday is laundry, Monday is bathroom cleaning, and we over schedule that, we lose our inherent gift of sorting um, and ordering. And he talks about like this is an ant nature thing. Um, it's a very primitive, instinctive, quiet, and unique to every woman. So he talks about the importance of like having what you do when you're ordering and sorting stemming from more of a feeling value. So it's not this like imprisonment thing that women need to do to themselves, but it can be like, it can be really like what you feel or like, like we have this unique gift to like feel our way through the ordering and the sorting. Um, and that whole, you know, I would really encourage our listeners to listen to that tale or like to seek out that tale of Cupid and Psyche because it talks a lot about what I think this poem is talking about is how can you approach life and these tasks without becoming too inflated or deflated, without becoming too discouraged by the menial tasks like feeding rabbits. Um, and like Willie, like me, sees all the good in all of these things. He sees good in all of these like heroic duties. He wants to be field marshal and and all these things. And it's or even like your day to day tasks, like like giving the monkey boy a coin. And how do you choose? How do you choose? And I, I just think like that Robert Johnson speaks about that or in that that tale of of Psyche and Cupid how there's just like an order to what we choose as good and when we can focus on on these simple things like one goblet at a time that can be really really powerful yeah and that i was looking up the virtues a little bit in preparation for this but do you know what the definition of humility is i think it related to the earth right well the the root of that word is is that yeah which is interesting mm -hmm. um but it's the moral virtue that keeps a person from reaching beyond himself mm. it's the virtue that restrains the unruly desire for personal greatness and leads people to an orderly love of themselves based on a true appreciation of their position with respect to god and their neighbors so yeah, that's exactly what you were talking about. That's that's the virtue that goes along with that part. But yeah, the root of humus come it means ground or earth. So that is kind of interesting. That's How crazy. you said you were ground, you know, you, that kind of grounds you at the beginning of the days. Pretty cool. It is. I mean, I it is cool to see that intersection. Um, yeah, it's um, really illuminating the virtues for me i'm gonna get off my virtue kick but i do want to read one more uh <laughs> no. quote here because i've heard it said before and i said it before about charity being the ultimate virtue uh and uh the a quote by saint gianna i i have never heard of but it really explains it to to me well um she said with faith we orient ourselves toward god with hope we invoke him, and with charity we possess him. That is, we unite ourselves to him. That is why charity is called the queen of theological virtues. It is because, as St. Paul says, while faith will have no more reason to exist in heaven, because we will see God face to face, and so hope will cease because we will possess God, the supreme good we hope for, Charity will remain and will be the only flower that adorns the soul. I just think that's pretty cool. It is. And I mean, oh, yeah, it's just so, uh, yeah. Because, okay, we're talking about, I, I think that quote kind of reflects this idea of like inflation versus deflation. And when we think about like becoming God, that's a very inflating 
thought to me, isn't it? Becoming God? Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, or like, okay, can you go back to that quote for a second? We unite ourselves to him. It's not really saying we're becoming God. God. Well, that's probably a more Eastern way of reading this, though. I mean, we will possess God. Yeah. We will see God face to face, and so hope uh, will cease because we will possess God. So that is a very inflating thought. But the Father clarifies this. The man who was Lord of fate, born in an ox's stall, was great because he was much too great to care about greatness at all. Ever and only he sought the will of his father good, never of what was high he thought, but of what his father would. And this, when when I read that, it struck me as that passage. Christ did not esteem equality with God something to be grasped at, but rather he emptied himself out. And he's contrasted with Adam and Eve and this because, you know, I think in our, in our Roman Catholic tradition, we believe that God intended for Adam and Eve to, to be what Satan tempted them by. Like Satan told them they would become gods. Well, God had that plan for them. I mean, he, he wanted to elevate them to that almost that state. I mean, yes, we're always creatures, but God God intended them to always have eternal life with him, essentially. And, you know, St. Athanasius says God became man so that man might become God. And, you know, it's hard not to go too far with that statement, but um, nevertheless, it's there. But like what, what, what the father is saying is like, this is how God is. This is, he does not grasp greatness. He does not, he is not inflation, you know, um, rather he emptied himself out. I mean, he is like, he's emptying himself out Mm -hmm. for us. He died on the cross and. Well, he basically like deflated himself. Yeah. Like, we can't even do that by becoming man. Like, we can't, like, even when we're humble, we, you know, like, we're understanding that we are who we are, but we can't, like, go down. Hmm. What do you mean by that? Like, I can't become a dog. <laughs> no, you're right. Yes, but there is a, I mean, there is a way to deflate ourselves. You can't become a dog, but you can become enslaved. But I, I'm not sure what enslaved. Well, I think... What, what do you mean by that exactly? Well, I think this poem speaks about it in the beginning. The child, I mean, the father is saying, the child who stands at the high closed gate must wish to be tall and strong. If you did not wish to grow, I should be a sorry man. I should think my boy was dull and slow, nor worthy of his clan. So there is, you know, if we talk about the tension of the opposites, there is a tension here. You can become too deflated. You can become enslaved. Why is enslaved with... Why are you matching that up with deflated? Because I think I think that they are I think that they are related. Oh. I'm trying to flesh that out in my head. I mean, I feel it in my body. I'm just trying to like I'm just thinking, Yeah, like I the, know. Like I know. Jesus's character it was yeah, it's he's deflated form of God but not a enslaved form of God. No, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're saying we cannot deflate ourselves any further in a good way 
as as me- as humans. Yeah. I'm saying okay, yeah, you're right. I'm saying we could deflate ourselves in a bad way as humans. But you're not which is like you're to not become deflating enslaved. yourself as a human. You're still a human. You're just an enslaved human. Yeah, which is a form of deflation, I think, for us humans. If we, if we but it's don't... not a form of humility. It could no. be. It, it doesn't have to be no, a deflating fact, thing. It could be inflating. Yes. No. I. I think you're right. But I it mean, is mostly yes. inflating. Yes. I think you're right. I think we t- like the church will say like, um, oh man, like false humility is actually pride. Yeah. Yeah. Inflation. Yeah. No, I think they are two horns. Yeah. On the same goat. In fact, um, I just. <laughs> We we t- we bring in a lot of quotes, but they just they say it better than I can. And so, there was a great episode of This Union Life about it was called imposter syndrome. And I'll put I'll put all of these references that we're making in the show notes if people want to re- look at look into them themselves. Um, but Joseph Lee was talking about perfectionism, and he was just talking about how. It really is an escape of the person, like like perfectionist, and I, I you know, I struggle with this too. Is like really a way to escape this fear of being an imposter, but at the same time, it feeds their feeling that they are an imposter. So how it looks like the way he fleshed it out is like the perfectionist will set such high goals for ourselves to prove they're imposters because when they fail at these insanely high goals that we set for ourselves and we fail at them, it's like, okay, well, duh, like, of course I'm failing because I'm, I'm a fraud. Really ambitious or. So like, so like perfectionist, like, let's say I'm like, okay, like I wake up and I'm in my perfectionist, you know, zone and I say, I am going to clean my entire house top to bottom and it's going to be sparkling and I'm going to, you know, play with the kids, Baba Yaga, while I clean the house and do it all perfectly without any moment of (laughs) frustration at all. And that's what I'm going to do. That's my goal. And then guess what? (laughs) By 10 o'clock, everybody's screaming, and I say to myself, aha, see, I failed. I'm not supposed to be doing this. I'm not supposed to be a mother. I'm not supposed to be a stay-at-home mom. I'm not supposed to, like, blah, 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 blah. Like, if I could be perfect, like, I would escape all of that. It's like an attempt to evade rather than actually achieve. Because yeah. actually achieving something is doing menial work. It's doing, it's feeding the, yeah. the freaking rabbit. You know, all mm-hmm. day, every day. Yeah. And like, I, I just feel like that helps us escape this two-horned goat of inflation and deflation. Like, I feel like the father is protecting his child from a lot of things. He's, he's protecting his child from carrying the projection of a hero. He's protecting pride. pride. He's protecting his child from um, giving up his power at the same time by saying, no, like you are called to be great. He's protecting his child from being a victim of his unconscious. So Jung talks about befriending our unconscious through hard work because Here's the thing that they talk about in this Jungian Life podcast, too, is that so often, like, we don't know to what we should attribute our our successes and our failures. So they talk about how when we praise children too much and to to try to boost their self-esteem, they don't know why they're good at something then. So children don't know why they've achieved what they've achieved when we don't say these are the things that happened to help you succeed and sometimes we will attribute our like our success to luck they talk about that or 
the fact that we pleased people, but we won't look at the specific work that was done. And sometimes luck is part of it, part of our achievements, but it's so important to like name all these things, especially those little menial tasks. You know, if George were to come home and say, oh, I scored a home run at the baseball game. And we just say, oh, wow, good job, great. And we don't say, okay, you practiced five minutes every day with dad, you know, or you showed yeah. up. You showed up to, the, to all the practices and you did this, you did that. And who was pitching? Were they a really good pitcher? All of these little factors that went into that success, I think, need to be named because it is like these little things in life. It's not big these. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Well, that reminds me a little bit of Nebraska's football coach, Matt Rule. I'm a big Nebraska fan. And now we're getting real. Yeah. <laughs> but one of the best things I think he says is, like, we work so hard day by day that when you get to the game, the game is a celebration of everything that you've worked for, and then you're just having fun. You're not, it's not like work. It's a celebration of all the skills that you've prepared for, which reminds me of that. And I just I love that. That's why they're going to be really good this year. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I agree. I'm, I'm drinking the rule aid as a Badgers fan, I yeah. will say. I do, um, I am into Matt Rule, Nebraska Rules, R-H-U-L-E-S. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think yeah. you should read Sir Gibby because there's a lot of characters in there that speak towards your deflating and mm. inflating that was the the one work that i've thought about with this poem for sure that i haven't even read it all i just have read the i don't know the first maybe 60 or 70 pages there's some really good beginning chapters in that book but gibby is definitely a, a great example of somebody that I don't know what you could say is more of a, well, very humble, but there's a part in the book where, he, where George McDonald describes what Gibby's basically goal is in life is to get his father home from the bar safe um, and go, goes in detail with how he does that and keeps him upright on the cobblestone and stuff. and. I think that is such a good example of what he's saying here a little bit. Um, you know, obviously the father is drunken, and so he's, you know, blinded by the fact that his son has to do this. But Gibby just does it. He sees it as his duty. He doesn't even know that that's not normal and so I just think it's yeah. George McDonald has a way of bringing this to light in characters and uh, seeing the inflated character in a, in a, like a very polar opposite um, mm -hmm. characters that really speaks to this a lot yeah, I think especially, too, I think we mentioned, or I mentioned in the first podcast episode we did on King Cole and how, for union analyst Marion Woodman, she talks about how spirits, like alcohol, is sort of like a symbol for the spirit, for God. And an addiction to alcohol is a desire for the spirit, God, but like, it's it's that two-horned goat where the inflation and the deflation are warped. And so it's so interesting that the father is drunk on spirit. 
and Gibby is not, you know, or he mm-hmm. is, he's doing the work that his father should be doing. And, you know, I, I remember we started reading that book together and it just struck me as so sad. I mean, I, I couldn't go on. I couldn't continue in that book because the way that he wrote that is just so sad. I mean, and I'm glad you brought that up, though, because um, one quote that Robert Johnson said that I also want to bring into this conversation is he says, if you wish to give your children the best possible heritage, give them a clean unconscious, not your own unlived life, which is hidden in your unconscious until you are ready to face it directly. And I don't even know what that means fully, but when you talk about Sir Gibby and his father, I mean, there's clearly... His father has an unlived life here that's that he's being a victim to. And it's Gibby's job then to do the work that the father is not doing. And so, I mean, I, I can see where you think that that's, that's virtuous of Gibby. And it is, but it's also really tragic to me because Gibby isn't doing things for himself. Self, though like he's not doing this important work for his own life he's doing it for his father but how can you say it's not for his own life either how can you say it's not his it's not his duty in that in that situation of his life it's not the will of god that he does that regardless of why his father is drunk. I don't think it's the child's job to live the parent's life. I think the child should be able to do his own work of play, listen, you know, interiorly, as the father in this poem we're discussing says. I mean, the father... If you, I, I think, like, I just have one more point to make about this. Like, if you contrast the father and Sir Gibby, the, who's drunk on spirit and inflated and deflated all at the same time, with this father who says, I am a boy myself, I have my own inner voice to hear, that, I guess maybe I'm moving closer to what this quote by Robert Johnson means of giving your child a clean unconscious and not your own unlived life. Well, I think, yeah, and I don't think George MacDonald is saying that's an ideal way to raise a child, but one thing that is in common with the story, with this father in the poem and the father in Sir Gibby, I mean, the father in Sir Gibby is really clear that he doesn't want Gibby to, he knows that this is not a good life, but he's so addled in the addiction that he can't get out of it. But he's very, he's very strict that Gibby doesn't drink or get to that point, which is interesting. Well, he's got the humility to not be like, say, like he cares about his son not turning out the same way as he does. Um, which, yeah, I don't know if that's giving him a clean conscience or not, really. I mean, I don't, I don't think it is, just because it's you know he says that, but then. Gibby has to get him home, and he's yeah. you know it's like. <sighs> but uh, yeah, and I think I think it's an overly extreme example that uh, George McDonald uses, but it does I it does say that to me that okay yeah the father does, in Sir Gibby the father does have some, humility to be able to step back and say, like. Gibby shouldn't be following me. He should be following his, true father. Hmm. and there's a there's a scene in that book where Gibby hears his dad um, 
praying about his addiction to to God. And I think it's really clear in that exchange that the father knows that he has no business really being a father to Gibby. And Gibby is way better off mm -hmm. with God as his father, you know. But isn't that spirit again? I mean, I don't know. I just feel like we're on shaky ground here. I, I see the addiction coming out even in that prayer. Go to spirit. You never mind your earthly father. I don't know. I struggle with that, I guess. Well, like I said, mean, I don't think it's the ideal. I just... Yeah. Well, no, you're right, Sean. I mean... It's, <laughs> he's turning right. a positive yeah. into something that looks so bleak. Yeah. And... Is, it, is, that, is that worse than having a father that's got everything together, but is telling their son, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this, you got to do this? And yeah. I don't know. No, it's not. I mean, I think, I think it's back to that, that inflation and deflation, for sure. It, it's hard. I mean, oh, man, I just feel like that discernment, though, is so difficult and i do love seeing willie struggle with that discernment and that the father doesn't give him a clean cut answer i do just want to pivot for a moment to how willie um is talking about the boys at school and he's differentiating them between his brother and then he talks about this rule that is just in Bedded in nature, and it, it ain't ever going to go away, no matter how hard some of these Protestant churches try to er eradicate it. Um, but he says, somebody first, is there the rule? It must be me or another. And so I think he's talking about this thing in nature of, like, survival of the fittest, dog eat dog. Somebody has to be on top, and it's either going to be me or another. And John and I are watching this show on it. No, it's on Prime, like Domina. Domina. Mm -hmm. Domina. It's not for the faint of heart. I think it's a very honest look at the Roman Empire. It takes place in the Roman Empire before Christ. And honestly, it's not brutal enough, if you ask me. I mean, it's not like... By that, I mean, I don't want brutal things. I just feel like it's a very graphic show, but it's probably tamed down, you know, from what it actually was. It's kind of like Game of Thrones. And I think they do a pretty decent job. But, like, that is what, I mean, that show does a, such a good job of showing how humans have related to each other throughout history in this doggy dog it must be me or another somebody's got to be first and the father is like oh willie it's all the same they are your brothers all for when you say hallowed be thy name whose father is it you call and i do think like this is what christianity shifted i mean i don't think it completely eradicated it but it did shift that narrative and i do think like that is what is so unique about christianity when it enters into a culture and starts to interact with it and again i don't think you can fully eradicate that because now i think we're in the realm of cults and utopian societies like i mean if we're being honest, this is the promise of socialism, which is to, like, make everything equal all the time. So I just want to be careful that I'm not, I don't want to go to that degree. There is a place for competition, and somebody's going to be first, and, I mean, this is just nature. Right? The snake eats the toad. The snake eats the mouse. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, Christianity does flip it around and say the last will be first. Yeah. First will be last. Yes, I know. I mean, it, I, 
Yes, the, like uh, maybe I'm just saying, maybe I'm coming to a place where it's hard for me to understand the relationship here because I, yeah, I it's think a difficult thing. It is a difficult thing because I don't think it fully eradicates it. No, but it does change it. It changes it. it changes yeah. the relationship. It challenges it big time. Yeah, and I don't think a lot of us are challenged enough with that today. I like, think. how do you mean? I I think there's there's more way more people that are you know living their life according to their will than God's will. How how do you judge that? Well, I think almost everybody lives their life that way, except the saints, myself included. Is this false humility coming out? No, <laughs> I don't know. I don't, I don't know. How do you I've not mastered that? the virtues, obviously. Is it about so, mastering the virtues? I mean, is that like, is that a... I think so. That's what we're here for. We master the virtue of charity. That's the, basically the goal of our life. Do you master it or do you there. become it, maybe? Or... Become mm-hmm. charity? Yeah. Well, well, actually, it's given to you. Yeah. Hmm. Which, which I, I need to understand that even more. But mm-hmm. I do think it's reliant upon your actions as well. Yeah, I think they're a part of it, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. But it is given. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, I think that's the whole St. Augustine fleshes this out. I mean, are we, yeah, he talks about this relationship, like, are we holy because we choose God or are we holy because God chooses us? Yeah. I think, is, I hope I'm remembering that right. I guess to my point in saying that was like, how many people do you truly know that don't really care at all where they stand amongst other people. If, you know, financially, title-wise, how many kids they have, or anything like that. They truly don't care about that, but in a way that is positive, not like I just gave up on everything. Hmm. But there's a positive, like, super positive, like, wow, that person is, like, the most humble and you know person's got got what everybody else is looking for there's not a lot of people that that stick out to me like that well it helped when you said but also hasn't given up on everything yeah because someone who was very wise once told me that that is another power play to give up and oh, I just really struggle with knowing what that je ne sais quoi is, that middle between too much power. You know how I talked about even Robert Johnson, like not having like a schedule of like, this is laundry, this is, this is laundry day. This is, and like thinking that we can control ourselves and our environment to the extent that, that like the life is just squeezed out of it versus chaos, which is just this other, it's like another form of the power play. And it's not the ordering and sorting that is, is unique to woman's gift in a certain yeah. way. And I have no idea. So what do you like? How many? Well, I was just thinking about this. The the guy that the Sound of Freedom is based on, that movie. I forget what his name is. Sorry. Um, but how many people do you know that would do what he did, and gave up his government pension, of like millions of dollars? He said, to do what he was doing, like just a couple weeks before he was going to get all that money. 
when you have six kids and a wife, and I don't know how you do that. But then does this, okay, but Sean, all right, I'm going to push back. I mean, this is my contrarian nature, but like, is this paying the monkey boy before you, I mean, should he have done that? I I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't how know. How do you discern that? I mean... I don't know that I see that as the epitome of virtue necessarily, or I, I don't know. Look, I mean, I, I'm grateful oh, for what, I question. mean, it's a good question. I, yeah, I'm grateful for what that guy has done. Don't get me wrong, but I just, I'm not sure. No, it's tough. I don't think we can for surely discern that and you bring up a good point, but. Guess I'm trying to like how how many people do yeah, you know no, for sure know. <laughs> that you would be like totally confident that they have this? I was like, I'm just saying it's yeah, no, I don't know anybody. Small number of people. Yeah, I don't know anybody, but like, hmm, yeah, I don't know. I mean, what does what does this actually look like? Because was that actually a good thing that he did? Was that actually virtuous, or was that as the father says, or like you know, Willie? This, this exchange here. I mean, the father calls it a little door. And I'm just not sure it's always so obvious. Yeah, I it's just, it feels like, it's a like little door. that guy's duty seems to be helping trafficked kids. Yeah, amen to that. And that's yeah. why he was, made his decision was to do that. Yeah. So, I feel like it's probably in line there, but I don't know for sure. Yeah. But. Yeah, I mean, you're right. Like, some people, I mean, our church is full of saints of all sorts. Some mm -hmm. are kings, some are paupers, some are intellectuals, some are, I mean, I think they were maybe even in insane asylums at some, or just like considered to be kind of nuts. I mean, some were fools, some were, yeah. There's room for everyone, right, at the table? Mm hmm Yeah. You know, I was thinking about how um, George MacDonald inspired Lewis Carroll, and I couldn't help but notice some similarities or some things that reminded me of Alice in Wonderland. So there's the rabbit, there's, like, the little door. Um, and I think like those are images found in Alice in Wonderland and that could be a whole other podcast episode, I guess, like what those, those images mean in Alice in Wonderland. Um, but I also looked up rabbits cause I think it's interesting that George MacDonald chose rabbits as Willie's like task to feed. And I was reading about how, um, in cultures and, and in Christianity, like they were used in Christian art in the Middle Ages as a symbol of like resurrection. And this is why I think they're associated with Easter. Um, and so I think it's interesting that like he has to feed this like this resurrection element of like he has to die to his idea of what greatness is, the inflation and the deflation. And what resurrects in that is his path, is his work that he has to do. Yeah, okay. um, and so I don't, I don't know if George MacDonald intended that, but that's definitely, that definitely struck me as, as an interesting connection. Yeah, well, that might be a good place to end it. I thought that was a... Pretty strong point you had. Yeah. No, this was fun. Thank you for listening to our podcast. If you liked what you heard, please do consider becoming our patron. You can head on over to patreon.com and you can find us. We're called George McDonald and Us. And we have support for as little as $3 a month. So if you'd like to join us in getting George McDonald out into the culture. And if you appreciate our discussions, please do consider supporting us in this way. Again, thank you for listening. If you enjoyed what you 
heard, please share it with your friends. Yeah. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.